Welcome to Everything Comes Together. My name is Sri Nag and I'm an architectural photographer based in Chennai, India. My guest today is architect A. Venkat of NVA. On Everything Comes Together, I'll be speaking with people in the broader photography, architecture and design communities. Rather than only talking about their work, we will be talking about them their personal journey, the challenges they overcame, and the most pivotal incidents in their lives that made them who they are today. So now, let's get to it. My next guest is one of the biggest names in Indian architecture and should need no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. A prolific architect, A. Venkat, has built a solid reputation over 40 years in the industry, and his firm NVA is an institution in the Indian architecture scene. He's widely known as a straight talker and my conversation with him was no different. You'll hear a fascinating story of how he built his practice based on unwavering principles, putting himself in the right place at the right time, and what it was like to work with the great Sri Lankan architect Jeffrey Bawa. I come from a fairly well-known family, so that was a big advantage first. My parents were quite well known in the city of Chennai, or Madras as it was known as. My grandfather used to be the dean of the Madras Medical College. My father had his own business and he was quite successful in business until a particular point of time. So I had a very stable background. I mean, I had an absolutely stable childhood. The funny part as, as far as my family is concerned is we are three brothers. My eldest brother, who is no more now, is 18 years older than me. And my second brother is 8 years older than me. So there is a vast difference in age between the three of us. So my elder brother was more like a father figure to me. Right? Even though I was a brother, I used to keep looking up onto him for many, many things. And uh, so also with my, with my second brother, right? That that age gap used to be there. So it is not that that we are very close and I could play with my brothers and stuff like that. So that's as far as childhood is concerned. I studied in Vidya Mandir right through. And uh, I was probably one of the worst students ever to come out of Vidya I think I could have given you some competition for that. Right. Probably. I, I used to struggle. You know, I've done every damn language possible. For a couple of years, I tried to do Tamil, I failed. A couple of years, I tried to do Hindi, I failed. A couple of years, I tried Sanskrit and just about managed to stay afloat. So, school has uh, memories of being a very poor student. And uh, that's always in the back of my mind saying that, you know, but then that's destiny. So, you know, from, from Vidya Mandir, I moved on to... Uh, we were kind of the college to do our pre-university. Those years we had to do something called a pre-university. Of one year of college before you decide what do you want to do as far as your profession is concerned. And the cutoff mark to get a first class in pre-university was 600. I managed 603. And my family thought I was, you know, one of the most brilliant students ever to come out, you know, in the family and that I've done exceptionally well. Not realizing that I just managed to get it by about three marks. Right. So anyway, that was uh, something that everybody appreciated. And, you know, I, I thought it was again, it was just a stroke of luck that I managed to get a first class. So as far as my childhood is concerned, as I said, very happy. No regrets. Nothing to ever, uh, you know, worry about or, you know, don't have any complexes regarding all that. And uh, that's about it as far as uh, my yeah. early years are concerned. And um, how did you actually get interested in architecture? I didn't. I didn't. I had no clue as to what I wanted to do. In those years, either you become a doctor or an engineer. Since there was already a doctor in the family, and my second brother, that's my eldest brother, my second brother was a chartered accountant. Okay. They felt that an engineer was missing in the family. Yeah. And so I should, I should try for engineering. Well, you'll have enough variety between the three Absolutely. of you. I mean, that's what they wanted. They wanted variety. I had, I still remember, it's again a very interesting story because it uh, makes me 
wonder at myself and laugh at myself. Um, I went into, uh, everybody said try for engineering and you know the, those years the IIT entrance exam was a big thing. So my father and mother said why don't you try for IIT you know after all you've got a first class in pre-university yeah. so you must be a good student. So that, that exam takes three hours. I saw that question paper. I didn't have a clue as to what all those questions were. I fiddled around for 15 minutes and I walked out. I was probably <laughs> the first to walk out because I knew nothing about it. Okay. Right? So that shows you, you know, what kind of mind frame that I was in and what kind of knowledge I had. Because at about 16, 17, your knowledge levels are very, very poor. You know, yeah. unless you're a geek, I mean, that's a different thing. Unless you're one of those absolutely uh, hardworking kind of uh, school students who sort of knows this, he was brilliant from the time he was born, which I was not. So, so then they said, you know, let's try engineering. So I tried for mechanical engineering. I tried for chemical engineering. I tried for even textile technology. I tried for leather technology. I got into nothing. None of it. Absolutely nothing. And somewhere along the line, somebody said there's a course called architecture. Why don't we try for it? So the course, as far as the architecture course was concerned, uh, I was a bit uh, lucky again with the contacts that I had. You had to have some letters of references. My father knew old man C.R. Narayan Rao of the famous C.R. Narayan Rao firm. Oh yes, of course. So my father requested him saying that, can you give him a letter of recommendation? He wants to do architecture or at least I want him to try for architecture. Okay. Can you give him a letter of recommendation? So I got a nice letter of recommendation from C.R. Narayan Rao as far as architecture was concerned. And um, there was another friend of my father's called Mr. A.M. Barnachalam who was the chairman of uh, the uh, Murugappa group who also gave a reference letter saying that I came from a good family and that you know my upbringing has been good and that I should make a good career if I were to become an architect etc. So that is as far as the letters were concerned. Our entrance exam those years mm -hmm. was to sketch something. They'll keep actually they'll keep a, a flower vase with a leaf and you have to sketch that out. So we're about 50 people in the test. All right. And I can see, you know, if I take this pencil out and if, let me assume that they, you know, that's where the, the vase is kept. You know, I could see people looking at it like this, measuring the heights, you know, getting the exact scale and various things. And I knew nothing about all this. So whatever it is, I did my shot that I was not too bad at sketching, but I was not so well versed like how the others were getting things to scale and all that. Sure. But I somehow managed to do the drawing. Maybe it was luck. Maybe it was a couple of good reference letters. I managed to get a seat. So that was a big relief. But I knew nothing about architecture. Right. But actually, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but um, that's not obvious today that you knew nothing about architecture. Because um, architecture is probably like other art forms where you need to have that innate ability. Where do you feel that that innate ability seemed to have come no, from? No, see, there was no. That's what I'm saying. It's very. It was more of circumstances. This is all I had. I had to make the best of it. How I made the best of it was left to me. Right. Maybe I was street smart, maybe, you know, I thought a little bit harder than others. And from the day I joined college, I said that, you know, the first few months it just went off because again, you know, Vidya Madhur was a purely boy school. Vivekananda College was a boy school. Oh, back then Vidya Mandir was purely a boy school. Yeah. And suddenly you're put into an environment where out of 20 students, there are about seven, eight girls. So, you know, the first few months, you're wondering how to adapt yourself with studying with boys and girls together and things like that. So that took a little time. But having said that, then I, uh, it so happened that 
I was also involved in the sport of rowing by then. Oh, okay. So, one of the... And this was while you were in college? When I, actually, I started when I was in school. You know, early, late school, last couple of years of school and early college years. Okay. That gave me a lot of exposure to people. Hmm. That's where I bumped into Bharat of Bharat and Associates. Because he was a member of the club. I see, okay. So, uh, you know, he would, we were just chatting and he, you know, I would say hello to him in the club and things like that. We were all students, so I just casually asked him saying that I've just got into architecture. I know you're a famous architect and you know, you run a very successful practice. Can I just come and learn along, you know, while I'm studying? He said, absolutely no problem. Come whenever you want. Even if you want to come and spend two hours in office, please do come. That was nice of him. So there it was a question of being street smart, street smart to try and see whether yeah. I could use that as an opportunity to learn. So I learned that. So that's how I started going into Bharat. And see, college only teaches you a little bit. It's very fundamental. Finally, it all comes from within. And that within, at that age, your knowledge is very, very, very vague. So going and working in a professional office, right, you learned a hell of a lot. Practical experience. Absolutely, because while you're trying to learn something, you're actually seeing something happening. Yes, yeah. So that uh, was, I think, was undoubtedly one of the best things to have happened to me. And how was it working for... Uh, oh, it was great fun. They never... They never treated you like a student. They treated you as an equal. Right? You know, for everything it was, it was, uh, uh, what shall I say, it was all teamwork. Right? You'd be surprised mm -hmm. if I tell you that the first couple of days of joining the office, mm -hmm. my job was to sharpen pencils. <laughs> I had to push the pencil across and see whether it makes that mark. Only then the pencil is sharpened. So, <laughs> I'm saying these, nobody teaches all these. Yeah, to make sure that your pencils are perfectly sharp before you start So, drawing. I'm just saying that it was, uh, you know, and they would all, there was always a senior in office who would sort of give you some work. It could be very basic drawing work. But at least you knew what a drawing, how to do a drawing. Right? Over the years, while I was this thing, right through, I did that even in summer, I used to go and work for Bharat. Over the years, you slowly get a little more exposure yeah. as to what electrical is all about. What is plumbing all about? What is the proportion in a building? How do you detail out a kitchen? How do you detail out a toilet to make sure that your shower and your spout comes exactly in the center? These are things that are not... When you look at a, a shower stall, you know, if there are, let's say there are 10 tiles, you're exactly in the center of the fifth tile. All your fixtures must come. Now, these are not things that are not taught. These are things you learn by experience. You can always turn around and say, but isn't that very fundamental for you to make sure that that's what it is? At that age, it doesn't you know, strike you. So these are things you constantly learn. It was great fun working and I think uh, um, that helped me a lot. And I did fairly well in my college. I also had my sports background. So what the sports background does is, it teaches you about teamwork. It makes you a smarter human being in terms of taking on pressure, especially when you race, there is pressure. There is a con constant butterflies in your stomach. You get over all that at a much earlier age. That's what competitive sport does to you. So that helped a lot. And exposure to people. Yes, of course. You know, yeah. learning to talk to people, learning from looking at people and the way they behave. At 17, 18, 19, it's very important. And how to manage a team and work in that environment. How to, how to forget about yourself and be a part of the team. Because in rowing, basically, it's either you can either be a single scholar, as it's called, that's yeah. singles. Or you can go in a pair with somebody else. Or a four. And I was always either doing the single or the four. So which means you had to get along with three others. Right? And there was no shamming. There was nothing. And 
you had to put your best foot forward to survive and we i think we did fairly well for our age at that time and what did you do after you graduated from college uh, that the very um, you, you see my sister said we my we come from a large family my my, my father's youngest brother and i was very close to him and uh, i come from a large family my uncles and stuff like that and this uncle of mine was based in bombay and a very successful businessman he used to run a company called rally wolf okay. and uh, he was living on top of the factory as thousands on top of the factory and way out in a place called buland which is pretty far off even then yeah. so he said that why don't you come to bombay and try working in bombay and i'll put you on to a firm called architects company and we've been our company's architects for many years they very respected firm there it, it's uh, and i'm sure that will be a good place for you to learn so off i went to bombay and uh, joined architects combine on a salary of 275 rupees a month <laughs> right okay. and i'm talking about 1978 right so the advantage was i was staying with my uncle so i didn't have to worry so much about uh, rent and stuff like that leave alone rent what about food and things like that but anyway architects combined is a great firm to work with there were five classmates very uh, reputed architects kamu ayer was one raja puredi was other there was one mr mandrekar then there was dilip rohit they were all incidentally classmates who started as soon as the, you know they graduated in 1956 they started this company and the name architects combined is five friends combining together to run a practice right each partner had his own practice but yet they were just contributing to the running of the firm so whatever they earned they took it other than giving a share so it was a learning experience they were never made you feel as if you were a fresher they gave you importance they made you feel important for the fact that you'd spent a good 5 years studying architecture also the fact that having worked with bharat helped me a lot because i had already worked in an office and knew how an office works then what happened was within about 3 months uh, they had a branch in bangalore and they said would you like to go and work in bangalore so i said uh, why not because it's one close at the home and also the fact that that was a much smaller office there were only about 3 or 4 people so i thought the learning process would be better if i went to a, a smaller setup yeah you would get more responsibility so i moved immediately to bangalore but the tricky part was my salary was increased by 50 rupees to 325 and i had to live in 325 hire a room you know take a room on rent and then manage your food and stuff like that so there was a learning days that learning curve the way to conserve money all that you know came quite naturally it was tough but we managed it so but there there's a very funny story there because i was sharing a room with three others a uh, two others again my rowing friends oh, people from the sport okay. of rowing who had incidentally got jobs in bangalore one was a, a ba the other was a bcom the guy who done a ba was earning 2000 rupees the guy who done bcom was earning 1050 rupees and here i was and their course was just 3 years mind you mine was a good 5 years and i was earning 325 rupees so that day or around about that time i said to myself that whenever i start practice an architect will be treated with respect he will be paid well so that he never gets the feeling that he is underpaid compared to other professions so these are things that you learned through the hard way because you learned them through experiences it's not as if it's you know you you, you know you were a whisk kid and you all this happened to you you learned something because of what you've gone through in life and these are very important experiences while i was while i was working with uh, architects combined in bangalore i'm not very sure but i think it was uh, um a friend or a cousin or somebody who spotted this advertisement that came in the newspaper in the indian express asking for architects to work 
for a company in Colombo called Edward Reed and Big. Right. Uh, so I, so that, that was sent to me and I immediately applied. I still didn't have a clue as to who Jeffrey Bauer was. Wow. I didn't have a clue what Edward Reed and Big was. Okay. Right, because don't forget, I was just about nine months into being a full-fledged architect. And then I started doing some, they, there was no internet there. So how do you try and find out what an Edward Reed and Beg is? And the interview letter that came was a postcard, a handwritten postcard that said, come for an interview in such and such a place in Chennai, in Madras, on such and such a time. It's only when I went for the interview, you know, that did I realize when I saw this six foot seven, absolutely hefty, a British looking gentleman who introduced himself as Jeffrey Bawa. Jeffrey Bawa did your interview? Absolutely. My God. Jeffrey Bawa did the interview. And uh, maybe because the way I spoke, because of my background and things like that, I got a job. So, you know, it then when I started speaking to people, they all say, oh, you got a job with Jeffrey Bawa. You don't know how lucky you are. You know, I said, yes, it is. And, but it was only after I started working in Colombo, when I actually started seeing the office and seeing the kind of houses that they had done, I realized how lucky I was to get that kind of a job. The exposure changed 180 degrees all the way through. There was no coming back. It's that exposure to having working under that gentleman who's one of the most brilliant architects I've ever come across, you know, and um, seeing his work, I was very fortunate that, you know, me and another friend of mine, a senior of mine in Chennai called Jeevan, we were both uh, selected to work for Jeffrey Bhava and we were work, we, you know, the, at that time he was designing the parliament of Sri Lanka. Okay. The, it was a design build uh, assignment and the contractors were Mitsui of Japan. So you had the advantage of working, learning from Bawa, getting the Japanese technology of precision by working with Mitsui because their architects were also part of this team. So your, the way you presented your drawings, the way you standardized things, all those advantages came from working with the Japanese. You know, so I think these are all experiences that you never look back on and you're damn grateful that you got them. Right, so my stint with Bawa lasted about three years. Thoroughly enjoyable time in terms of, term, terms of not only living all by myself, but I'm saying with a couple of friends, but also the fact that it was not very strenuous work. You went into work at about 8.30, took a break at 12.30, came back to work at 2.30, worked till 4.30 and that was it. That sounds like a lovely day. Great, great, great place to work for and you know the time was also, of course, you know, knowing ourselves, we did push ourselves that little longer. Uh, so that was a great experience working for him. Managed to work on a couple of beach resorts while I was there. But more than anything, the exposure of looking at what he's designed. And getting it dinged into your head that this is the way things have to be done. That is the learning curve. So what exactly from his work really spoke to you? Landscape. Landscape came to him so naturally. Right? And the, his architecture was completely, you know, how, how do I put it to you? It was... It, it was not the modern stuff that you keep talking about. It was everything that blended with nature. It had everything of reuse of materials. You talk today of, of conservation and all that. He was very simple, you know, he found an old column somewhere, he'll immediately use that old column in a building. He'd start hunting around for things like these. So I'm saying his style of vernacular architecture was stunning. That's where I learned, you know, I'm known to do a lot of tile roofs and slope roofs and even today people specifically come to me as Venkat as Venkat as an architect not as the boss of NBA 
saying that if I go to Venkat, I'll, this is the kind of style I'll get. That is all what I learned from Baba. Right? The style of architecture is very, very reminiscent of Baba's. So that was my biggest takeaway from having worked there. I noticed that as well um, at your farmhouse. Yes. The use of the landscape and materials that you had used, um, that was something um, that, you know, that, that was so evident as I was shooting. This, that is also, let me interrupt you, that is also because having learned that, you know, landscape is something that's very natural. Yes, yeah. You know, it can't be sort of done prim and proper and, you know, perfectly clean and things like that. It has to be as natural as it comes. And that's something that's always sort of uh, been in the back of my mind when you relate a building, especially when I do so many courtyards. Keep it as natural as I can. It cannot be a manicured kind of a place. Yes, absolutely. It has to be something that's very natural. And a bit wild. Absolutely. There's, yeah. there's no doubt about it. You know, it shouldn't look sculptured. That's... These are all learnings, as I said. So, that is my stint with Bhava. At this point, I suppose you um, would come back here. No, before that I got married. My wife and I spent our uh, first couple of months in Sri Lanka. Um, we were also expecting our first child then. So, I must forget, not forget to mention the fact that, the, you know, from 325 rupees salary, you were told that you're going to get 3000 rupees salary okay. when you went to Sri Lanka. Wow. But then, don't forget that 3000 are actually 1500 Indian rupees. Half the money, but still that was much better than About 325. five times as much. Right? But then, Cost of living in Colombo was also higher. So to manage a wife with a child to be born at 1500 rupees Indian was a tough task. But those are all learning experiences. So, you know. Then I, uh, while, while talking about Sri Lanka, you know, my, my brother, my eldest brother, he actually, he he moved to Australia and he was been working there as an orthopedic surgeon. He was very keen that I moved to Australia to do my masters. Um, on one hand, he was saying that come to Australia and do masters. On one hand, I felt that you know my experiences of having worked with Bharat and all that, saying that you know maybe I should give it a shot, starting my own practice. The fact that my wife is expecting our first child was also tilted it to the scale of saying that I want to move back to Chennai. I'm going to be a father and we're going to have raise a family and I prefer to raise a family at home yes. in Madras rather than elsewhere. So, so that prompted me to come back to Madras. And um, incidentally, you know, all these things, things, you know, they have a way of reappearing in life. Bharat ended up doing, uh, getting up, picking up a job for an, uh, you know, for a uh, school there in uh, Sri Lanka and he used to come there often and he did end up spending a lot of time with me because I also had the opportunity to take him and show him Bhava's work. Right? At that time I was throwing up this idea of saying that look I've been told that I can go and do my masters or I can come and should come back to Madras and start practice. He said, uh, you're true, you know, Bharat is one of a kind. A gentleman to the core and, a, you know, he's got no qualms about helping people. He immediately said, you know, if you're coming back to Madras, I'll give you a job. Come and work part-time for me. I cannot offer, we are already five partners. And no way can I offer you anything more than just a part-time job now. Right, I'll be fooling myself if I said that, you know, you work with me and I'll give you something later on. I can't. You come and join our firm, work part-time, work in the mornings. You'll, you'll be paid a salary, which will help you tide over things. And in the afternoons, start your own practice. 
and use Bharat and Associates as a runway to take off. This is his true inspiration. That is extremely generous. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. So that's why I said that keep some things keep coming back to you. That's why Bharat came back to my life, or rather, I went back to his life. And I have another little interesting coincidence here. Um, it was only through Mr. Bharat that I got introduced to you. Oh, is that right? Back in 2005. Right. So I had met him very early on. And um, I had met him, Miss Jayashree and the other partners in the firm. Tara, Chino and all of them. Yeah. Balaji, Balaji. Yeah. First, I only met both of them. And they gave a guy who was just starting off the time of day to, to you know, to even talk about my work, let alone their own work. And I can see that generosity that you just mentioned. I saw it in a very small way, um, but it was there. They didn't know me at all. They were all great people to, yeah. you know, as friends, yes. as people to look up upon and uh, as an office to work. So, and you know, they were also very gracious enough to say that, you know, they were quite a large firm. There were all these additions and alterations, jobs that will come. You know, he would very, very generously give those jobs to me and say, you practice, use this for your practice. You know, so there were about five, six jobs, like those small jobs that helped me start my own. But starting my own is, again, it's easier said than done. Uh, through uh, my co-brother, uh, who was in the round table, he came to know that one of his tablers is wanting to, a house to be built on TTK Road, which is a prominent address. That guy was a Gujarati. Businessman. So it just my co-brother casually mentioned him saying that I've got this, uh, my co-brother who's come back from Sri Lanka. He's got different ideas to what you generally see. Why didn't you give him a chance? So that is my first job that I landed up. And uh, so there again, the you know, when you're given one chance, you can never afford to screw up. It's that one chance that can either make or break you. So you have to stand upside down to make sure, you know, it makes you, not breaks you. When I did that house, all my influences of Baba, all the influence of getting courtyards within built spaces started coming back. And that house actually was a very cute little house that slowly started at, at, you know, attracting attention on TTK Road. So that is my first job. And does that house still stand today? Unfortunately, it's hidden by a lot of multi-story buildings that have now, now come up, but you really can't see it. So that's the sad part. But the client is still a good friend of mine still, and you know. But now, why talk about this uh, story is another story that comes to my mind about, uh, as I told you, you know, earlier, I, my parents are quite well known. They had a wide range of friends. And one of those friends was a gentleman called A.M. Marnachalam, who was the chairman, as I mentioned to you earlier, who gave me a reference letter when I joined architecture, yes. was a good friend of my father. Now, his advice to me, just after I got married, was uh, he asked me what I wanted to do. He knew I was work, you know, working in Colombo. So he said, what is it that you want to do? So I said, you know, I have the option of coming back to Chennai to practice or Madras to practice or go to Australia to do my master's in the University of New South Wales. He vehemently said, don't come to Madras, go abroad, stay abroad and do your master's. It's far better. Now, you know, when I, after having decided that I'm going to start practice on my own, I didn't have the guts to go meet this gentleman. <laughs> it so happened that my brother bumped into him somewhere and he asked my brother, what is it that Venkat is doing? To which uh, my brother said he started practice on his own. And the man immediately started fuming. In his own words, he very clearly said, Nada on a Varakudadan Sonene, Yang Yavanda. Nada on a Vilinat Lapadin Sulene, Yedikin on the practice Aramcha. 
anyway it is all right ask him to come and meet me and let me also talk to him so my brother told me this and i went and fixed up an appointment and went and met him yeah. i'm shit scared as to what he's going to say <laughs> because here this man had told me not to come back and but i said okay you know whatever is what let what has 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 to happen let it happen he was very nice enough to say that listen i can't promise you anything but give me five copies of your uh, curriculum i'll circulate it to my group companies if there is any opening if they want an architect anyway they'll call you luck i ended up uh, getting a call from tube investments because they had a beautiful nice piece of land in archbishop bethas avenue and they wanted row houses to be done um so luckily the you know the the, the person there the, one of the family members incidentally was also my eldest brother's classmate in psi school so when he read the name and when he went to the cv he said okay we know the family so why don't we give him a chance so i was called and at the brief was given this is a man no other than a gentleman called mr mb subaya who's one of the most respected industrialists of chennai today so i was given the brief but what was not told to me in the brief was that they had a problem with the land in those years there was something called an urban land ceiling and if you had excess land you had to surrender it to the government this piece of land had a little bit of a problem those years the responsibility of getting a municipal sanction rested with the architect it's only now that you have license agents and things like that those years you had to do everything yourself so it is not only a question of just designing to get it off the ground you had to make sure you get the sanction so the experience of having worked with bharat earlier of knowing how things are done also taught you that this is the way you go about it so i approached the corporation and you know told the corporation that this is where it is i never spoke about the problem saying that it's an ulc but i also knew that you know i did a little bit of spade work and look at looked at the memorandum of understanding of the company yeah. where it was basically a trading company and a trading company had more chances of coming under the ulc than a manufacturing company but in that memorandum it is clearly said that that particular company could get into manufacturing at any point of time so i used that as a loophole to say that even though this land company there is a ulc problem the fact that they could get into manufacturing any time is deemed that they could be a manufacturing company so i made sure that using the gift of the gab yeah. and the smartness somehow i managed to get the sanction so the question of survival is just not restricted to architecture right but that job you learned much more about you learned another another way to learn is one is having worked with bava one bharat etc but where your knowledge comes is learning from the workman you go and stand if you go and stand at site and see how a workman does his masonry you will understand why he uses that pr- 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 proportion for mixing the sand and cement to get the mortar you ask questions as far as he is concerned he will treat you with, because you are educated he will think it's a big thing for him to teach you so he goes out of his way to teach you right similarly you know talk, talking to carpenters what does an architect know as yeah. to what a dovetail joint is it's never taught to you all this is never taught to you this is what you see when somebody makes something with their own hands do you learn how things are made so the when you get a job the fact that you stand there and learn these things i had nothing else morning was barat afternoon was this job and i learned everything there but talking of this uh, tube investments this particular job that i did this is in an, in a road called the archbishop das avenue very prominent road right behind madras club the location makes a difference it makes people more aware of what's coming that to in such a prominent location 
So not only must you have the luck to get the job, it, you must be lucky enough to get it in a prominent location where it's noticed. So doing this uh, house, uh, the three uh, row houses in uh, Archbishop Mathias Avenue, again the teachings of Baba came, the practicality of Bharat came, and the learning curve of going and standing at sight came. I've always by habit been a very early person. You know, I like to get out of get, get things done as, as soon as I can. So every day at about 8 o'clock sharp, before going to Bharat's office, I used to go to this Archbishop Mathias Avenue site. And um, I used to go there every day at the same time, 8, 8, 5. Suddenly, you know, one of those days when I was going at that time, somebody stopped me on Archbishop Mathias Avenue and said hi. It happened to be an old acquaintance called T.T. Raghu, who was actually T.T. Krishnamachari's grandson. Yeah, from the T.T. cake. And uh, he said, uh, whenever you have time, he was just chatting with me and he said, whenever you have time, why don't you drop and I want to just see you. So I went and saw him. And he said, I've been seeing you every day at exactly between 8 and 8.5, going past near motorcycle. And I've been seeing the progress of work at site. I want to build a house and I want you to design it for me. Because I like what I see coming up. I like fresh ideas. And number two, you seem very committed and hardworking. So I want to make sure that you're the guy who designs my house. Great break. That's a huge break. Fantastic break. So I'm saying, you know, as I said, going back to what I said, if you're given one chance, never miss it. Make the best of it. And it was simply your discipline of going to site and monitoring your project that impressed someone. I, I really wish today's architects learn all that the hard yeah. way of saying that, you know, I need to go to site more often. I need to spend time at site because it's one thing to sketch and do a drawing, but it's a completely different ballgame to make sure it's built the way you've drawn it. And unless you're there and spend time at every stage, you will miss out on a lot of things that you actually conceived. Anyway, that's another story. So let me go back to that story. Sure. I don't want to. In all this while, uh, <clears throat> I must talk to you about how the firm, how Nataraj and Venkat, all this while it was just Venkat, A. Venkat as an architect and that's yes. how the jobs went. For the Cuban Investments Group, for whom I already started doing this, uh, work in Archbishop Mathias Avenue. They were also using other architects and one of those architects was a gentleman called B.S. Nataraj. B.S. Nataraj is actually five years my senior. You know, so the year I joined, he'd already finished architecture. But I always knew, I've heard of him because of his creativity and I've heard of him also for the fact that he comes from a well-known family. His father used to be a very respected ENT surgeon. And uh, anybody in Chennai would go only to Nataraj's father for any ENT problem. But that apart, you know, family, friends and things like that. So he was a known person. So I was told by the then Mr. The, 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 you know, then by Mr. Arnachalam saying that at least for our jobs, why don't you and Nataraj join up together and work together in our jobs? We'll feel happier about it. Maybe he had the foresight of saying that, you know, this is a way of joining him because for one, he was exceedingly creative and I was extremely hardworking to use that combination. <clears throat> yes. So we started, Nataraj and I met for the first time over coffee in Drive-In Woodlands. Not a bad location to start it's a location business. To start. <laughs> yeah. I wish drive Woodlands was still around, Drive-In Woodlands is still around, but we started there, we met there and then said, we'll give it a shot. And we started working. And that was the start of NVA? We're talking, of, we're talking about 1984. Right. And that's how the tragedy maker actually was born. Was born. Um, we actually slowly then, you know, he felt comfortable with me. And I, he was another great person to learn from. 
See, an architect also needs to be good in proportions, needs to be very good in mathematics, needs to know his fundamental mathematics exceedingly well. And you couldn't find, find a better person in these aspects than Nataraj. I learned what is it to work in modules from him. I learned what the correct, even though I had worked with Bhava, it was Nataraj who taught me the correct roof proportions, which is far sharper than what Bhava used to use. Yeah, so I, I'm saying that the process of learning never stopped. So I became very adapted to his style of working, which is purely on grids. People will say you're very rigid. You know, you're, you're not free flowing, but you know, you're using an octagon and just keep repeating the same thing all over again. You're taking squares and working around with squares. You know, no, but that was, there was a, there was a proper belief in the way he used to work on these things. And it was far easier using a module. And yeah. which is again, something that I learned using modules is something that I learned from him. The roof proportion is something I learned from him. He and I used to sit across the table and work out estimates of buildings. You catch one architect trying doing it today, they won't be able to. It is quick work, it is pure mathematics. It is very easy to do. But that's all self-taught. So anyway, now going back to the story, you know, we started handling the Murugappa group's work. Then uh, by which time he picked up a job for the Lawrence School of Dale and then he said, why don't you know you also come and work along with me? So I started working with him on that project. Then some job landed in my lap and I said, why don't you, you know, work, why don't we work together on this? And that's how we started this. Yeah. But seeing some of his work and seeing some of my work, a lot of people became more aware of saying we should approach these guys to design our residential buildings. So most of the residential development that came up in Chennai in the early, late 80s and early 90s were all designed by us. That is because they saw the work that we had done in our residential houses, that they felt that these guys have a hope that we can bank on in terms of coming out with something different. So Nataraj and Venkat actually started growing quite fast. You know, we were just two of us, then it became four, then it became six. And uh, did you ever think it was growing too fast? You didn't have a choice. <laughs> okay. You didn't, have, you didn't have a choice, you know. Actually, the, the Natraj actually always felt that we were growing too fast. But I felt that, listen, you know, you, you can't say no. If you say no now, you don't know when the next job is going to come. You must take it in your stride and put in that extra effort to yeah. make sure you're managing everything. It was tough. It was a tough call, but we never let off or, you know, we didn't let go of our steam and continue to work at a tremendous pace and still churned out quite a lot of interesting work over those years. But that would also mean that you didn't have Jeffrey Bava working hours. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. It was very interesting, you know. Uh, finally, uh, Nataraj, the greatest compliment I've ever had. Is he calling me a warrior? That's a nice thing to be called. I said, why? He said, you're the only warrior I'm wary of when it comes to design. Because we used to compete with each other in design. And he says, you know, he used to use a particular Japanese word, you know, I'm getting old and I'm forgetting that. And he used to say very clearly that, you know, the master teaches the pupil and the pupil beats the master, right? right. So we always had this a very healthy competition yeah. amongst us. Yeah. And the winner who wins the design would buy the other a bottle of whiskey. And that was our simple bet for many, many years. And so, but it was great working with him. And that's how NVA started. And uh, of course, NVA today is a legacy, but you know, those were tough days for us to start yeah. with. How long was he Part of the firm? Part of it till, see, he worked till about 1995, very actively. In 1995, we started picking up more of the interiors. You see, we started doing a lot of commercial buildings. 
and people who moved into these commercial buildings wanted us to do the interiors. He felt that it was not our cup of tea. Plus, he'd suffered the, his third heart attack. So, he wanted to basically cool off. And from about 95 till he died in 2000, he was doing more of teaching, you know. Yes. Um, he was uh, doing small little jobs. He was doing a school and things like that. He was doing things that he didn't need to spend too much time on. And something that gave him greater happiness than working full time at this belt. So, he, we, we, till 2000 we were together. 2000 he passed away. So, that's what it is. One thing that comes across when I speak to you is every element that you talk about, every question that I've brought up in every piece of conversation that comes up, one thing that's evident is how important that your principles are and discipline and work ethic and things like that. How do you feel that it helps you in building a firm like NVA? No question about it. First is integrity. Integri integrity comes from good upbringing. Right? The fact that you want to be clean and respected is the most important. That cannot be taught. It must come from within. But you then teach this to the people who work with you. Teach by example. Teach by example and tell them very clearly that your name is more important than fame. Money will come and go, but not people. Right? Your name is most important. Absolutely. And even today you need to be respected for what you are. Not only are you a good architect, but sure. you need to be a good human being. So learn to be a good human being first. Yes. And then a good architect. The other thing is, uh, I think leading by example is hard work. You know, it's, you know, you have to put in that 10 to 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day at least you need to put in. You cannot just keep on saying that, listen, I'm t time is up and I'll take it easy. You can't. You know, you have to put in that hard work and that hard work is something that drives, you know, you again drive by example. Not only is it hard work, it's also the smart work that you've got to put in. The speed at which you work. See, one success point of NVA has been that if somebody takes eight hours to design something, we do it in three hours. So we've trained our minds to work fast. And that comes from experience, that comes from the fact that, you know, you're sharp and the fact that you're very aware of lots of things. Yeah. And I think that's a fact that you can't forget. And uh, something that was... The, the only thing that I seriously wish the younger architects should learn is never give up. There are a couple of things that you need to be, you know, you need to be successful. Mm -hmm. Hard work, integrity, and most importantly, luck. That element of luck is very important. You cannot keep on riding your luck. If you have the luck, you have to make sure that you work hard and you're straightforward. Never, these three Actually, the classic example of how you can be successful, right? And that's something that you've got to be patient. It cannot come overnight. You, it, you have to be patient about this. I, you know, I'm probably digressing, but I just think there is a point that it's I, definitely important. I just want to bring it up while we're talking about this. We talked about this off camera as well, about the different architects you have worked with who today have set up their own successful practices. How has it been seeing other people grow? I'm so happy seeing them all do very well. Not for anything else, it comes from pride. That they also learned something from us. You know, today they're far smarter than us. But the fact that he was a part of us, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, NBA still continues to be a family. If you take a Sri Ram Banamthi, you're so successful today. If I were to just call him, he will do anything for me today. That comes of the relationship that we've had while he was working with us and what we have now. Respect is most important to every professional. It doesn't matter whether he's a competitor or not. Respect good work. Appreciate good work. Call somebody and say that, hey, I saw your building and it looks classy. You lose nothing. I think that's very important. That comes through with 
with the way you have treated your employees as well when they're part of your family as you say the fact that you as you mentioned at the beginning of our interview you said that you always wanted to treat architects with respect and i suppose they have that same level of loyalty back towards you no question no yeah. we, i've they've never ever been you know rare cases one in 10 i would have had a problem with uh, somebody in office but other than that i think we i we've been very lucky to have the kind of people we've have we have people who've been working with us for 30 odd years why would they stay for 30 years if they were not comfortable they would have left it's that happiness of being given a fair deal of given the freedom to design of having been given to think that the freedom of saying it's my own office is not it's not the office it's my own office so it's yeah. that kind of warmth that we built in the firm and i think that was most evident during the 2008 financial crisis yeah yeah that was a bad time uh, at that time you know today we are about 36 37 but at that time we were close to about 75 and we had to let go of so many people but i must honestly say that actually i felt so bad asking people to leave i made sure that i got every one of them a job elsewhere so no one was left Not hanging a single person was left hanging that's also because i'm a people's person i believe in the warmth of the other person i love, want to be warm to the other person and i think earning the respect of the other person is very important to me that's something you can't buy it has to come from within certainly so that's what it is now you treat your team and your staff as family so speaking of family how much involvement do you have from your own family in the firm today um my wife she's not an architect but then she handles a lot of administration in the office so she handles the accounts so which i am not a i am not too much of a maths kind of a person when it comes to accounts and stuff like that so she is there to take care of it unfortunately that both my daughters are not here otherwise i would have been very happy if you know they were to be a part of this family of the firm my elder daughter is in dubai and she's married and okay. my younger daughter is a landscape architect more so the reason why she should come and practice here but she's very happy in california and wouldn't want to come back here for some time now so yeah. wishful thinking <laughs> that's about it but i also think that you know you know when people spend 30 years and 25 years with you they're also family so that's something you can't forget and you never know what happens later Absolutely. on yeah yeah true so Now where do you see NBA going from here when i first met you you had said you were taking a bit of a step from the day to day i actually wanted to actually you know to answer your question i actually wanted to but if i did that i'd get completely bored and, and there's, there's no, no reason, reason to do it. no i i don't i don't see any reason i live behind so convenient for me to come into work yeah. i see faces i see people i mentor them so you know what i'd like and me to be is to learn to live without me whether it's going to be possible or not i don't know but that's what i'm working towards building an organization that can survive by the name nva it's not the individual but it's the organization that's important that's what i'm trying to invite to all my colleagues so yeah, let's see where we that's stand that's a great place to end this yeah. interview because i think there is so much that people can learn just by listening to what we talked about now It's not just about the work. It's not just about the firm or who you work with. It's also how you treat people, how you treat the work, and the discipline that's required to keep things going for a full career, and how satisfying that can be. Thank you so much for doing this. I must thank you. Thank you. It's been a wonderful chat. Thank you very much. Well, that's our show for this week. If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it and help get word out about this show. To watch this and other episodes of the show, please subscribe to Shreenag Pictures on YouTube or you can listen to the audio podcast by subscribing to Everything Comes Together on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify or on the podcast app of your choice. The music for the show was composed by Ashray Harishankar from Escapist Music. Post production by Tiruvikraman Srinivasaraghavan. 
of SNS Arts Development Consultancy and production assistance by Abdul Jilani. You can reach me on Instagram at Srinag or from my website www.srinagpictures.com. I'll be back in two weeks with another fascinating guest who work in photography, architecture or design. Until we meet again, it's goodbye from Mylapur.